Hey, it's Jade inviting you to another current virtual session. And today we are joined by the frontman of the National, who now has his own solo record. It's called Serpentine Prison. It is Matt Berniner. And thank you so much for joining us today. And I, I wanted to say, you know, this has been such a, a weird sort of reset time for a lot of people. And uh, how, are you, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, I am. I'm resetting too. Yeah, I'm rewiring. I'm adjusting. Um, I like being home this much. I do like that a lot. But it's it's hard. It, it it is it is hard not to see people in person that much. It's hard not to see people's faces. You know, and only people's eyes. It's hard not to be able to go be you know be with around people in restaurants and in subways and 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 and, and i find that really um alienating and, and and unstabilizing you know or destabilizing so that part of it's rough so i kind of swing i swing back and forth between finding great great sort of comfort and just being home and and, and trying to rethink um how to approach you know life or whatever you know everything and yeah. then also just really missing the simple things yeah yeah, I think it's it's weirdly a combination of being grateful for all the little things and like discovering those little things in your life and then just missing things so much. Uh, but one of the things that has been a comfort is all of these new albums that we've gotten this year from people and listening to new music. And you do have a, a new album and a solo album. And I, I've always been a huge fan of The National and you guys have played together for several decades at this point. So what was it like going Ew. into a room with a whole new team? Well, it was interesting because almost everybody who um, I worked with for my solo album, I've either worked with before or throughout the national, or I met and, and got to become um, a, a collaborator with through the national. So it, it feels like an extension and everybody that I worked with has worked with pretty much everybody, or at least toured with everybody in the national and my other band stuff, you know, and, and, and Elvi also is, you know, is involved. So it wasn't like there is, um, and, 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 and when I'm in the studio with the national, there's a lot of people, you know, it's the national doesn't feel like, like five guys, you know, anymore. So it, in, in some ways, it wasn't that big of a leap. What, what was the biggest difference was sort of the process. Um, the National takes their time, and it's a laboratory of experimenting and ideas. But this record, I kind of made really quick, didn't overthink the songs too much, and we recorded it in about two and a half weeks, and, and just wanted to give it that quick live feel. So the speed kind of at which we we made it was the biggest difference and that was really that was really fun to, to move fast and loose and and not overthink it um so just the process was different um in in that way and were these all new songs this was nothing that you kind of had in your back pocket that you were thinking about but entirely like spur of the moment writing it was a little both i think some of the songs, like the first original, like I started out making covers. I just wanted to do a record of covers with Booker. But then I had a few originals that I had sort of laying around. And two of them, one of them was Distant Axis that I had written with Walter Martin from The Walkman, who I've been writing with for a long time. And another one was, was a song that I wrote with uh, Michael Brewer, um, who was in my first band, Nancy. And I sent those to Booker. And he was just really, really excited about them. And he was in many ways more excited about those than the big collection of covers that I thought that I, I wanted to try to do with him. And, and so once we added those to the mix, I just started writing more and adding more to the mix. And so a lot of the songs were, were written, you know, with Booker's encouragement to write more, but, but, you know, a lot of them were sort of kind of, I'd had the lyrics or it had half-baked ideas with all these different people that I didn't know what to do with. So Booker was sort of the unifying principle. He's like, let's focus on more of the originals and what else do you have? And and then I just started started working on those and with everybody. And so it switched to a record of originals kind of like that organically. And um, yeah, I didn't have a plan on putting out a solo record uh, until I had suddenly made one. The best things happen like that. And I, I'm curious about the, the Booker T connection because it feels like 
you and Aaron and Bryce, it's like you guys made a list of all of your favorites back in the day and somehow all of you are working with these heroes of yours. And how did, how did it come to be that you and Booker T. Jones got to know each other and now he's producing the album and playing, uh, the organ playing on there is really beautiful on the new record too. I would say the National has allowed us to just cross paths and, and meet so many people, you know, R.E.M. And, and Bruce Springsteen and, you know, all these incredible artists. And, and I think the reason, the way I got to meet Booker was he asked me to sing with Sharon Jones, not, no, no relation, but the late Sharon Jones on his album. And um, we did a duet called Representing Memphis. And that was about 12 years ago. I met him and just really, really had a good time in the studio with him and got to meet his wife. And, and I just really thought he was just a really fun person to be around. But I didn't keep in contact with Booker. It, it wasn't until about 10 years later that I uh, was listening to Willie Nelson's Stardust, which is a record I love. And, and I flipped it over and saw that he produced and arranged that. And I was like, I've always wanted to make a covers record. Booker produced and arranged my favorite covers record and I know him, you know? And so I reached out to him again after 10 years and I said, Hey, would you want to do this? And right away he was like, I'd love to. That's how it started. Yeah. I kind of pinched myself. Yeah. Um, so many amazing, I mean, the national, because of the national and, and that success and that we've met presidents and we've performed for astronauts in space and we've hung, you know, hung out with Michael Stipe on Halloween, you know, it's just like, it's, I can't believe the things that have happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's surreal. What's what's been the most surreal? Was it was it presidents or was it Michael Stipe on Halloween? And also, side note, what <laughs> what do you well, what did he wear as a the Halloween? Obama's costume? there too. Yeah, in Obama. <laughs> well, Michael Stipe wore a, he dressed as a banana. He was King Banana. Um, Perfect. And um, it was in Berlin, and we all just put just made costumes out of whatever was was around, and I think we all went as like sort of like punks with mo mohawks and and you know whatever uh, British invasion punks or something, and he was King Banana, and we just kind of followed him around Berlin all night. Yeah, it was amazing. It as was you amazing. do. I mean, like all of these things are surreal. <laughs> Yeah. But then they're also, they're also, you can't believe it's happening, but then it's also just kind of like any other night, you know, kind of looking for the party, ah, this party, like, you know, hard to find where you're supposed to go. It's and Michael Stipe still, still is out there struggling to find uh, euphoria the same way we all are, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, if anything, I think this pandemic has humanized so many people that people look up to. Uh, I, I mean, the fact that we're doing this sort of interview where I'm in your space. We are in, you know, uh, a place that is uh, a comfort yeah. to you that perhaps you never thought people project. were going to see. This is all a projection behind me. This is all, I designed this in, uh, in Roblox. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm a MS Paint behind you right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I do want to go back to those covers that you've been doing because this was supposed to be a covers album. And if you do get the deluxe edition of the album, uh, you do get to see some of those covers. There's a, a great Velvet Underground's cover. Uh, Morphine, I, I dig a lot. And so I'm glad you did their cover as well. But thinking about those covers, how do you approach covers? Why, why did you pick those songs and why did those ones still end up on the album? It's it's funny. I had a list of like 30 things I wanted to cover and we just kind of started with those. And that's kind of as far as we got because we started working on originals. And why did we start with those? I think Booker really liked those when I shared it. He's like, like let's, let's, there's a Betty Swan cover, which she, she didn't even write it. I can't remember who wrote it, um, but I, I fell in love with her, her version of uh, Then You Can Tell Me Goodbye. And so I covered that. And a lot of it was, was when you cover another song, regardless of it, how simple you think the song is or how many times you've sung along to it, you it, it's a whole different thing of actually, you know, stepping into that outfit and going out into the world and wearing those clothes. And, 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 and you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. I, I learn a lot about melody. I learn a lot about my voice by trying to sing someone else's songs and someone else's melodies and someone else's rhythms. I've, I learn about rhythm. When you try to copy something, 
um, you really discover what, what you don't know, <laughs> you know, um, about that thing that you think, thought you knew so well. And then you learn about, you just learn more. And so that, that's kind of why I wanted to do it. And it's, it's just fun to, to perform really well-written songs. <laughs> it's like, oh, the, the great songs, like even I can make this song sound good. It's so good, you know? Yeah, I think it was, was it Brian Eno who said like that's a great way to sort of break out of the trouble spots that you fall into with your own songwriting, those ruts that you fall into, yeah. uh, that it's a great way to break out is by doing some cover songs. Do you find that you are drawn more to, to cover songs or uh, are you writing right now? Because I, I think the pandemic can go kind of two different ways because I've seen so many artists this year releasing covers mm, and yeah. you know maybe that is I was something just talking up. about that with Jamie yeah. right? um, a lot of people are, are yeah it's interesting I think people are finding finding comfort in music um, throughout this I definitely have I've been there's been so many new songs I've never heard before from new artists I've never heard before or old songs that I'm just just allowing myself to maybe sit in more or, or spend more time with um, just because I don't know there's a lot of time to figure out what you're going to do with and and I mean, I've been reading books again, you know, it's like, 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 it's, it's other than just like airplane magazines. And so I, I do, I, I, I suspect people are just realizing some of the universal truths in all these old songs that made them the songwriters or the people they are, you know, um, and so many beautifully written songs um, that are well-written songs apply to these, to the moments we're in right now, even though they had, could not foresee where we would be in the world today, right? all of the like so just a good song that's that's a truthful about a person's you know anxieties or their desires or their fears resonate right now with all this stuff it's just like it feels like everything all good songs feel like they were written for for whatever moment you're in and um yeah, i'm discovering that you know songs that i i know this has nothing to do I mean, even serpentine prison my record has nothing to do with the pandemic you know it was all those songs were written before that I don't know. I, I, it's a funny thing. It's it's. I'm, I'm connecting more with music and art, and it's providing a lot of solace and 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 health. Yeah, I've been saying that because I feel I feel more grounded. At first, I did not, but now now I've sort of fallen into a way to keep myself healthy and stable. But I also feel like I am a grandma these days because all I do is I read, I puzzle. And uh, I recently puzzling. just, oh yeah, hardcore puzzling, uh, get very frustrated with it. So I'm not a natural puzzler, but uh, I'm like playing Settlers of Catan, uh, like via Zoom with friends. Uh, so just to like give myself solace, what's the dorkiest thing, the, the least cool thing that you have found yourself doing uh, during, during this downtime? I've been watching a lot of fishing videos on YouTube. Um, there's a guy named Bears Grill, and I also have been doing a little bit of fishing. I haven't been doing any catching fish. I've been just standing at the water fishing, which is still counts as fishing. It, it doesn't feel dorky, but I, definitely the watching of the fishing videos. I'm like, what? This is what's what am I doing? <laughs> you know, it feels it feels very zen, is what that sounds like. Yeah, yeah it's, you, it's you, nice. It's nice. It's 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 thrilling though to stand to to point of view camera of somebody reel in like a stingray. You know, it's fun to this, and he's just fishing off the coast in like northern north, somewhere in northern California. I think near near Oakland or something or San Francisco, and, and he just goes up and down just like his neighborhood and fishes around where he lives and just tells you how to fish and and like it's fun. It's not like out on a boat. It's just a guy goes to his local spots with a, with a tackle box and a rod and, and different rods and just shows you just how to catch fish, you know, off a pier. It's just great. It's easy. Yeah. It, it feels like that's a metaphor for something. Maybe it will. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think mo but most people like, I think people, uh, you know, surfing or fishing or, or hiking, um, all those things are simply a way to, to, to touch nature and get back to this sort of just, just the water and the earth and the things that it's not just because we spend so much time in our, we don't even touch the ground. We don't even touch dirt sometimes, especially I lived in Brooklyn, for, you know, New York for almost 20 years. And I realized you, you go months without actually your feet touching sand or dirt or, or hands, you know, <laughs> touching a plant sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's, um, we are animals. And I think, I think that is the big, people do stuff like that just to sort of connect with the planet. 
not to catch a fish. It's more just to stare at the water, you know? Yeah. And we've all been doing a lot more of that these days of connecting, hopefully. Hopefully yeah. that's uh, in, a, in a new and unusual, perhaps, way. But uh, to, to close us out here, because I know you've got other things to do, uh, we've been talking a lot about independent venues and saving our stages and, you know, how is this uh, ecosystem that we've built in the music industry going to sustain itself? Mm -hmm. And so um, when, you, when you daydream about be back on a stage somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what is that stage that you, you daydream you're back on? Well, you just made me daydream about First Avenue right now. You um, know, I just, um, I mean, I, I've done a ton of shows there. Um, you know, I remember, I remember being backstage there with everybody getting ready for a tiny little backstage with Justin Vernon and everybody and all crammed back in there. Just, and uh, I remember changing shirts Yeah, and it's all hot and sweaty and, <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember climbing up this, I, I yeah, you almost, there's, <laughs> the Nash was probably played in, 500 600 venues around the world maybe and i mean we, i think we counted new york alone we, we we performed in 35 or 40 different venues over the course of you know half of them are gone and um, those places are churches those places are are where i learned how to think about life those there were where i f met my friends where I, you know i met my wife leaning against a jukebox you know music music bars clubs are where I have found my whole world, you know, and it's my religion, you know, and, and it's, I, I have faith in it and I believe it. I'm also Catholic, you know, um, sort of, you know, but, uh, but music in those venues have been, and, and clubs and bars have been my churches for sure. And so, yeah, I miss them desperately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we all get back to church sometime yeah. soon. And uh, we'll welcome you back to Minnesota as soon as we are able to. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us. Thank you, Jade. No, this is awesome. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And Matt has that new album. It's Serpentine Prison. You can pick it up now. We've been listening to it a lot on The Current. And uh, I want to do a, a quick thank you to Jesse Wiza and to Derek Stevens for producing this. And thank you for watching and check back in for the next current virtual session.